This afternoon, it's my immense pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend, Sir Patrick Valance. Uh, Patrick will be known to many of you as a TV celebrity, uh, standing <laughs> nightly at our 5 p.m. briefings uh, with Professor Chris Whitty on either side of our senior politicians. And the reason I mention that will become clear. I'm actually going to tell Patrick something that he doesn't know about himself. But uh, Sir Patrick is the UK government chief scientific advisor. He's held that role now for four and a half years. I was very privileged to be the first chief scientific advisor that he appointed in his term. And I did personally want to really note Patrick's dedicated to commitment to diversity. And he's really lived that through his entire GCSA role. He also wears the hat of national technology advisor and he's co-chair of the Prime Minister's Committee on Science and Technology. He's also head of the government science and engineering profession across the whole of the civil service. And at the Science Council, we've been working very closely with Patrick's team to help to provide career support and recognition for science and science enabled civil servants, which again is a really important axis for change. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society and of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and if not very long ago, also an honorary fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, which I think was a great choice. Um, for many years, Patrick was a professor of medicine and led the Division of Medicine at UCL, and he has extensive experience of basic and clinical research, including in clinical pharmacology. And his personal research area was in the area of diseases of the blood and the endothelial biology system. In 2008 to 17, Patrick then moved into industry and worked in GlaxoSmithKline, where he became the global president of R&D and oversaw the discovery and development of multiple new medicines, including the world's first approved cell and gene therapy product. And so he brings a wealth of commercial and research experience on the global stage. I was very privileged to work with Patrick through my time as CSA at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And I think I, I don't think I'd be overstating if I said it was a remarkable time to work in government. It may even be an even more remarkable time now. I left one year ago. And what I saw Patrick do was be absolutely dedicated to driving systematic change across the civil service. He launched the Science Capability Review. And what this did was really make sure that each department led by their CSA, really had a system in place that was fit for their department, but also across Whitehall to make sure that we were bringing the best science evidence base to policymaking. And he's been absolutely relentless in making sure that the departments at the most senior level understand the value of that science advice. In addition to that, he's also worked very hard to make sure that science sits in many of the major policy areas. So, for example, the integrated um, review of foreign policy, defence, security and development. Patrick led one of the four main pillars of that to make sure that science and technology was fully represented and also integrated across the whole review. And internationally, countries around the world really were very impressed that the UK, despite what the political um, image looked like played through the press, we're actually able to pull together such a coherent strategy and that really raised the profile scientifically of the, of the UK worldwide. The reason I said I was going to say something about Patrick that he doesn't know was because I remember during our time dealing with uh, the COVID pandemic and obviously Patrick chaired the science advisory government, uh, get, get science advisory, Sage, there's, there's words in there, yeah, Sage. Um, and I think I, I spoke to the, uh, the health minister in Japan and we were on a call and he mentioned Sage, he's very interested in our science advice mechanism across Whitehall and out into our science ecosystem. And he said, you know, those five o'clock briefings, I'm glued to my TV watching them on the BBC. I don't know what time that was in Japan. And I said, oh, really? You know, obviously they're, they're very important. I explained the, the function of them and a little bit about the, how we were providing the evidence uh, to, to those forums. And he said, no, I mean, it's absolutely remarkable to see the quality of the science advice and the trust in science and that your most senior science advisors and your senior politicians have the confidence and the trust in that science advice to be interrogated with questions that are unprepared from a free press. And that was the gold standard that the world has looked at the UK. The COVID inquiry is upcoming. There will be a robust process to look at all of the evidence that came to the fore. And it was really Patrick's work with his Go Science team that really transformed our ability to communicate with our scientists and help our, our politicians and help them understand uncertainty at a time when we really work, were working at the frontiers of knowledge and radical uncertainty. And to help them to understand that when we as science advisors give them an answer, it's the best answer we've got at that moment. We tell them how confident we are in it what we don't know, 
what we need to do in order to find out the next bit that we don't know and when we're going to come back to them with a revised answer. And I think that approach, I hope, will be long lasting in government and be, will be one of many of Patrick's legacies. So, Sir Patrick, it's my great pleasure to welcome you up here. You have a very engaged audience. We've had an immensely buzzing day and you've got a very broad sector across all of the science and engineering professions, academia, industry, the public sector and policymakers. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carol. That was a very generous introduction. And thanks to the Science Council, because as, as Carol said, it's very important for us to be able to work with partners on the whole area of sort of professional development. And so uh, that's been fantastic. And uh, I've got news for you. Um, every, 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 every week in government is an interesting time and it gets uh, more interesting by the day. Uh, look, it's a great pleasure to be at this meeting. Um, September Arctic I see is decreasing by 87,000 kilometers, square kilometers per year. So every year we're losing Arctic sea ice. CO2 levels have dramatically increased since the Industrial Revolution. We know that. And if you look before that, of course, they varied, but they fluctuated around a pretty stable mean. We then saw a dramatic increase. It was actually that dramatic increase on a graph that uh, the last Prime Minister, when we took him through the data, uh, described as his um, road to Damascus experience in terms of knowing he had to do something about climate change. 2020 was on average, on average, 1.2 degrees uh, centigrade higher temperature than the long term average. Sea levels have been increasing between three and, and roughly five millimetres per year for the past 30 years. And global sea levels are 20 centimetres higher now than they were in the early 20th century. So whichever way we look at this, it is not only happening, but it is having an impact. And whichever way you look at it, it's happening because of a lot of man-made activity. The consequences, of course, are huge. Just in this country, we can expect summer droughts. We have summer heat wave deaths in countries in Europe. We get increased winter flooding. We even see wildfires. And I have to say, it was only probably three years ago um, when I was talking to some of my international colleagues about wildfires. And I said, I thought that there ought to be some uh, pack of science information that everybody could use so that countries that didn't know so much about it could learn from those that did. And I asked my colleagues in Australia and, and, and America to start producing some work on wildfires, which they've done. But at the time, I was making the point, of course, it's not really relevant to the UK, but I'm happy to sort of nudge it along. Well, it is relevant to the UK. And we saw that this summer. And all of those things, all of them come with costs. I mean, they come with, obviously, costs to people's lives sometimes, but they come with economic costs. And so one of the great... Um, myths is that somehow uh, the whole of the green agenda, the whole of the climate change agenda, agenda is purely a cost. It's actually an investment. It's an investment for making sure that you avoid many of the consequences that we know are going to happen. It's also an investment, I'll come back to this, because frankly, there is going to be a massive market for technologies that help sort this out. And you, know, you either want to be part of that or you don't. So the trend that we've seen will continue and we will face, as was really eloquently described in, in, in a recent paper in science, tipping points. And one looks at the sorts of tipping points that are close now and you can see that they could occur even within the range of um, uh, climate stabilization that, 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 that seems vaguely achievable. Um, and you go higher than that, and you see lots of tipping points. And you know, people rightly worry about collapse of the ice sheets, um, the effects, things like coral reefs uh, disappearing, uh, permafrost thaws, of course, as a tipping point, and uh, things like the uh, Atlantic uh, um, circulation that, that is, is beginning to uh, weaken. And, and, and that could be a real, um, really big problem in terms of thinking about distribution across the oceans. So, there are many things happening which should worry us, and there are clearly unarguable changes occurring. 
that's all fine. Okay, that's a that's a problem statement. And the question that um, politicians, countries, we all need to think about is: so what do we actually do about it? And I think that's important. And this group contains, I know, people who are academics and study this in great detail, people who are experts in measurement, um, and people who are from industrial and public sector research establishment backgrounds. And there is a very practical question here of trying to work out what do we do. Now, if you take the 2050 net zero goal, there is a danger that 2050 sounds a long way off. But the argument that I've been making since I've been in government and will continue to make is if you just take 2050 as your point and work back and say, what do I need to have in place at scale, at scale by 2050, you know it's going to take a long time to get anything at scale. So you've immediately taken at least 10 years of that, probably more, because you can't scale things very quickly. So when you really look at it, you've got to make some decisions on which technologies you think work or you want to back very soon. Then you run into the Betamax problem. Are you going to pick something that turns out to be completely wrong? So you've got a choice. Are you going to go early and pick something that might be wrong? Or are you going to wait until it's absolutely <laughs> certain, in which case you're probably too late? That means that the R&D that's required between now and let's say four or five years time maximum has to be focused on helping narrow those choices, has to be focused not to get down to a single technology, but which technologies look as though they are tractable and can be used. That is not to say that there shouldn't be a continued focus on new technologies. We're going to need things beyond 2050 and we must keep researching new things. But we can't sit here and hope that a magic bullet's going to appear in 2035 and sort this out. Therefore, the next few years, this is a very practical, immediate problem, need to be focused on technologies that we can already see, technologies that we've already sort of invented to some level, and ask how do we work out which of those we can implement and scale. And as we do that, and by the way, this, is, this, this I think is something that governments really need to do, and we push this very hard at COP26, that we have to move from high level target agreements to roadmaps as to what to actually do. They need to cover not just mitigation, but adaptation too, because we know there's going to be change in how things happen, and we've already seen some of them. <laughs> and countries across the world need to work out how they're going to actually respond to that. And that needs research, and it needs development, and it needs technologies too. So research for mitigation and adaptation, urgent timelines, thinking about, and I'm focusing on technologies at the moment, technologies. But of course, it's actually technologies and behaviors. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. So as well as the research needed, of course, to try and drive those responses, it's important that we continue to ask questions about the natural environment, about the impact on other things, like you know, what does this mean for disease spread? Uh, what does it mean for various other aspects? So there's a huge place for understanding still climate physics and trying to understand how we can get better granularity of forecasting. There's a huge need for research to understand the collateral implications, but there is a really important priority also to be practical on the innovation side. So science and technology are undoubtedly central to what we need to do. Thinking again about scale up and deployment, I can say this because I was an academic for 20 years, but I think it's quite common, and I was certainly guilty of this, that you sit in your laboratory and think, I've discovered it, therefore it will happen. And the easy bit is just somebody please go and make that happen. I learned a lot in industry that actually turning an idea into something that's practical and turning that practical thing into something that you can produce at scale and turning that into something that people want is very difficult. And so scale up is going to be a big challenge and just run through a few of them. Hydrogen looks like a good option in many ways for all sorts of things. There are some significant unanswered questions that we need to deal with, practical questions about how really can you put this, for example, into the gas main? What are the issues around embrittlement of pipes and leakage? 
Can we resolve those? Can we test those at scale? How are we going to make our hydrogen? How are we going to get to green hydrogen at the scale required with the electricity demands we've got for other things? Of course, linked to that are issues of carbon capture. Which technologies? Which are the ones we actually want to use? And can they be scaled? And what are the cost and practical implications of scaling them? We know that we're going to be reliant on nuclear. You can't do this, in my view, without some form of nuclear base load. What do we want to do? Do we want small modular reactors? There's some attraction to that. And by the way, most of them aren't very small, but um, we could do with some modularity of, uh, of production in order to get them out at the right time and the right price. Or do we want to wait and go for advanced modular reactions, reactors with the advantage of heat that they give off? So there, there are sort of key questions all the way along these technologies. And then you get into sort of areas like aviation. I was telling people earlier, and I was quite struck this summer, um, watching a bit of Glastonbury with uh, Greta Thunberg speaking, being cheered by everybody, absolutely fantastic, of which I guess at least half of them are about to fly off on holiday. You know, there are big implications for what we do. And if you take something like aviation, electric planes may be okay for short haul and relatively light loads, not yet cracked for more than that. And that may be very difficult. Do you really want to have to reinvent the jet engine? Because that is not easy. Therefore, you might be better off thinking about which fuels you can put in. And that leads you into places like synthetic fuels and other areas that you know about. That's true across transport. Generally, how are we going to think about that as a sector? And of course, it's really true across construction, um, uh, where we know a lot of the emissions are coming from. And we know uh, cement, concrete, you know, there's big issues there around the, the carbon load. And I was really pleased recently to um, visit the HS2 site, actually not, not far from here, and see some of the work that they're doing on, um, uh, on uh, reduced carbon emission um, concrete and, and, and other construction uh, approaches, including uh, completely carbon neutral construction sites. Really brilliant, actually, but um, something that needs to be quite quickly rolled out across uh, the rest of the construction industry, and that rollout is not straightforward. So um, as we look at it, we know we've got big systemic challenges which need to be tackled. And on the other side, there's demand. How much demand for energy do we as a society want? How much are we prepared to tolerate? And some technologies, of course, are going to help with that. So there's no doubt that there are ways in which you can use um, algorithms and digital approaches to try and optimize the use of what we've currently got. And that's going to be an important part of this. And there are all sorts of things you can do to reduce wastage. So, so I, I do think that's an important, the technologies are important there as well. But there are, all, are also, of course, individual choices that people are already making. And um, if you do the calculations, it's obviously quite dramatically different uh, what you need to do, depending on how people behave. So I mean, if everyone <laughs> decides that we all want to uh, fly twice as much as we're flying now and drive much more than we're driving now, it does have implications for what you eventually need to read. So it, it's not credible to say we can't don't take that into account some, in some way, whether it's a positive or a negative impact. And it's not the same as saying, uh, you know, society needs to revert to a sort of um, uh, a completely vegan uh, um, six layers of clothing sitting in your uh, your cave approach. That's not that's that's not what this is about. But it is a realistic assumption that behaviours will influence the scale of the task we want to get, and therefore we need to think about them. And as we all know, actually, you've got to make the green choice the easy choice. And the easy choice often means not only is it convenient, but also can I afford it. And so, uh, and Bill Gates has written, uh, written very well about this, about the green premium. You know, the, the bigger the premium, the less you're likely to want to do it. So, uh, and the, the catch 22, of course, is that until you start scaling things, the cost remains high. So there's a, there's a need to sort of get to the scale to reduce the cost, and then you need to make things easy. And we know just looking at electric vehicles that um, as charging infrastructure becomes uh, more common, as batteries become more uh, reliable, all of us start to think, oh, maybe I, you know, maybe I will have an electric car uh, uh, um, sooner rather than later. But that's dependent upon the things that would make you feel confident. So there's a big behavioral impact in this. So what, what we've been trying to do to give advice to government 
on this is, first of all, to look at the research and innovation space. And we published a framework last year, or the government published a framework um, uh, on what are the R&D needs and how are they likely to be impactful. That, I think, needs to turn from a framework to a delivery plan. And uh, you may have seen that uh, Chris Skidmore, who used to be uh, the science minister, actually, side, sidebar, I've been in post for four and a half years and I've had eight science ministers, two of them the same person twice, and Chris is one of the people who did it twice. Uh, but Chris has been asked to do a, um, Chris Skidmore has been asked to do a review to read out by the end of the year on uh, what, what it would take to get to net zero um, more efficiently and in line with economic growth. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable question for the government to ask. And it's a tough one to answer. And so I think you know, many of you, I'm sure, will be dragged into this in one way or another. But I do think a, a delivery plan has got to be part of that. You can't leave everything up to whatever may happen elsewhere. And you can't just get into procurement mode of saying, well, I'll wait and see what happens and just buy whatever seems to be the cheapest at the time. So I think there's a big challenge there. Just on growth, if you look at the investment uh, in the US, venture capital investment, uh, the percentage of venture capital investment that's gone into clean technologies is skyrocketing. And it's now at least 15% of all VC, and it's gonna go up much, much higher than that. So there is actually a huge market there, there's huge investment. People who are primarily interested in money, i.e. people who, you know, who are investors, are on top of this. So as a country, we need to ask ourselves, how do we become part of the technology creation and the wealth creation that will come uh, with that? And then finally, um, a big challenge for government and a big challenge for all of us is this is a full systems problem. It's got multiple parts to it. It can't be looked at in silos. And actually, if you look at, let's say, I want to go down the route of, uh, of using lots of land to create feedstock to create sustainable fuels. Well, that has huge implications for your agriculture policy and has huge implications for biodiversity and other things which are interconnected. So this is a systems problem that affects every single department in Whitehall and companies right the way across the UK and globally. And it needs to be tackled with systems thinking and that's where I think engineering becomes so important because it gives a structure to the thought process and allows people to actually look at trade-offs. And I'm pleased to say that, um, uh, that Bayes has now got a team which is pulling together a, a, a decent set of interactive systems maps so you can start asking what-if questions. You know, what, what, what happens if 40% more people have got EVs and you can sort of see the changes in other parts of the system? And I do think that's what we're going to have to do. It's difficult, but it's really important. And I think uh, a systems approach to this will lead us into the right place. So I'm going to stop there, Carol. I'm very happy to take questions uh, if there's time to do so. I've got a loud voice. I'll just say that. I just a, kind of an analogy. I'm a scientist within DEFRA supporting net zero. And one of the challenges we have, which you outlined, is we have the technology we need to invest in now to scale up. I use a COVID analogy, getting to the vaccines. But we also need almost the face masks now, something that doesn't solve the problem, but helps, even if it requires behavioral change. Is there anything we learned from COVID about getting people to adopt significant behavioral change that we could apply to net zero to get more immediate <coughs> action? Okay. Andrew McKenzie from the Physiological Society. Um, thank you for your, your talk. I wondered if you could uh, talk a bit about um, what you see as the impact of what has been successive changes in government from May to Johnson to Truss, and if you look at the opinion polls potentially another new government in 18 months, two years, how do you approach dealing with so many governments with so many different priorities in a short space of time when trying to deal with such a long-term systemic challenge such as climate change? Okay, um, on, the, on the first question, um, I think actually there's quite a lot of behavior change occurring already. And, uh, you know, you can see that the number of people who are reducing meat consumption has gone up, number of people who are taking active uh, uh, transport rather than, rather than um, uh, you know, personal um, transport rather, rather than actually using cars and things has increased. 
um, awareness is higher, people are thinking about, you know, how they heat their houses and so on. So I think there is actually quite a move <coughs> towards behavioural um, changes, which are not forced behavioural changes, but are ones that uh, you can already see that, that should lead to some decrease in, in demand. I mean, the biggest lesson for me, actually, is more around on the technology side. What, what did we do with the vaccines task force? We said we don't know that it's even possible to get a technology. Therefore, we need to take a portfolio approach. But we need to narrow that portfolio approach as soon as we can. Therefore, this isn't a procurement problem, which is what most countries saw it as. It is an R&D, a manufacturing, a supply chain and procurement problem. And that is, I think, what we've got to start doing now, not because we know the answer, but we know the range of answers and we need to start working on, on, on how to um, work out which ones we need to focus in on. I, I mean, in terms of the impact of change of governments, look, you know, I, I'm, I, you, you get ministers changing, you get governments changing. That's the democratic process we live in. Um, I think it's actually quite simple as a science advisor. You just stay absolutely stuck on science and you don't stray into you know, your own particular policy opinions or anything else, but you keep making sure the key tenets of science advice are there, which is, is there an adequate evidence base? And if the answer is no, do something to try and help get one. Is that evidence base understood? That's really important because it's not good enough to just say, well, you know, I produced a paper and I gave it to you. Why didn't you do something? You've got to make sure that someone understands it. Then the question is, can you use that evidence base to inform policy and options? And so it's got to be framed in a way that it can be turned into policy options and uh, um, uh, potential deliverables. And then the fourth is, can you actually put in place the mechanisms to monitor against that? And you know, there'll be chopping and changes of, 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 of political uh, views and there'll be uh, different pet projects and things that need to happen. But if you do that, you stay with a systems approach, then you stand the best chance of getting some long-term continuity, which we do need. I agree, I agree with the premise of the question. You can take those four tenants away and champion on a daily basis, I think. Mm -hmm. Duncan, here, please. Uh... Got a microphone so, well. two seconds. Thank you. Amanda from the Institution of Chemical Engineers. Thank you very much. Um, my question, I guess, is around in, in the face of the, the sort of planetary science and, and this, can, you know, the biosphere we know we have and, and then the sort of quest for infinite economic growth. What keeps you hopeful and where do you, um, yeah, I, I realise hope is, hope is not a science, is it? But um, I'm, I'm sure there must be things that keep you uh, motivated and engaged and, yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think, oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Andy Brown from Progressive Energy. You talk about the problems of scale up, getting from the lab to the combustor to the commercial scale. So, shouldn't we be talking in terms not in of R and D, but R D and D, research, development, and demonstration, because that will help uh, bridge the gap. I'll answer that quickly. Yes, and we published lots of advice on that. That's on the website. Completely agree. Um, on uh, on motivation. Um, I mean, I suppose it is a question about hope. And I, I will draw a COVID analogy. I mean, we had no idea we could make vaccines, but we knew we had to try. And I think, you know, we're in a tough position at the moment with climate, but there's a lot of ingenuity about, there are some quite interesting approaches to it. And there is, I think, a massive will amongst the population to do something. And so I, th I you know, I think this, we're an ingenious species and we will get to get to solutions here, but it does require concerted effort and it does require a real understanding of what the scale of the challenge is and what the timelines of the challenge are, because that's the biggest risk that people become complacent. And in, a, in a weird way, that's the biggest risk of the 2050 target. It just seems like quite a long way off and it's not. I think on that immensely positive but pragmatic note, um, I'd like to give my vote of thanks to Patrick for coming and giving us this very valuable time, which I know is a great pleasure. Uh, we will take a lot away from this meeting, and particularly that note of hope and practical advice as to how to implement it at scale, because there's a huge sense in this community that we now want to drive that actual real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.